Streaming only on Peacock. John Wayne Gacy killed 32. Straight from the killer's mouth. They want you to believe that I alone committed these murders. The new gripping six-part documentary series, John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. Just a heads up, Darksiders. Today's episode deals with crimes against children. It is definitely only intended for a mature audience. No little ears, please. Listener discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Today's story takes us to Narborough, a village on the outskirts of Leicester in the East Midlands of the United Kingdom. It was a quiet, suburban, almost rural setting. The perfect place to raise a family. It was safe, friendly, where everyone knew each other and people could leave their doors unlocked and let their children play outside freely. Linda Mann was a 15-year-old schoolgirl. She was bright, loved school, fashion and makeup, and she had a lot of friends. She used to babysit for local families as a way to earn pocket money to buy records and makeup. On the 21st of November, 1983, Linda left home to babysit one of the local families. Her parents had gone out for the night and Linda's two sisters were at home waiting for Linda to return home from babysitting. But as the time came for Linda's return passed and the hours continued to tick by, there was no sign of Linda. Her parents returned home and on realising that she had not come home, they began to comb the neighbourhood looking for her, calling out to her as they went. Their shouts garnered the attention of other villagers who joined the family in their search for Linda. But by 10pm there was still no sign of her. And so the family contacted the authorities. Little did anyone know at this conjuncture that Linda's disappearance would go on to have horrific, devastating consequences for not one, but two local families of this quiet, rural, sleepy mid-England area. And it would be the catalyst that would change the way criminal investigation is conducted today across the world. This is Darkseid, and I am your host, Suze. So what happened to Linda? Where was she? And why did the disappearance of this lovely schoolgirl go on to have such global ramifications? Hmm. Let's find out. Linda Mann had been reported missing by her parents the previous evening. It was fairly late at night, I think after 10 o'clock, when they reported it, and the search was made as much as possible bearing in mind that it was dark and nobody was about anywhere, so there was very few inquiries that they could make. David Baker, Detective Chief Superintendent with Leicester Constabulary, was assigned as head of the case, and he had arrived at the scene to conduct an extensive search of the village and the surrounding woods. But as we just heard, it was too dark on the night of the original search, and so they resumed the next day. And it wasn't long before they stumbled across a gruesome scene. The deceased body of Linda Mann. She was found in the woods just beside a pathway called the Black Pad. The Black Pad was the local name for a small, narrow pathway that ran through the woods and connected two residential areas in the village. It was a popular shortcut and one that Linda had used many times. After leaving the house where she had been babysitting, she had used this shortcut to reach home. But on this night, she never made it home. She was found just 300 feet, 90 metres from her house. When the police arrived at Linda's parents' house, Kath Eastwood, Linda's mum, broke down. She knew why they were there. Her baby girl was dead. The family were devastated. News of Linda's death sent shockwaves through the entire community. There was an immediate public outcry 
and this once friendly, crime-free village suddenly became gripped with fear. Doors were locked, children were kept in after dark, and parents forbade their children to take the black pad shortcut. A post-mortem was conducted, and it revealed that Linda had been strangled and raped. <laughs> she was 15. Semen was found on Linda's underwear and clothes, which were sent for testing. However, at the time, in 1983, the only information that could be ascertained from forensics was that the assailant was a Group A secretor. A secretor is when he or she secretes their blood group antigens into their body fluids, such as saliva, mucus, semen. Whereas, on the other hand, a non-secretor does not. Being a Group A secretor attributed the attacker to only 12.9% of the male population in the UK, which meant the police only needed to check 7.2 million men. Huh. The police began door-to-door -door inquiries and frequently used the media to keep the case in the public's focus. But there were very few leads coming in. Simply, there had been no witnesses. The crime had taken place after dark in a secluded wooded area. No one had seen anything. The police were getting frustrated because without a witness, they had little else to go on other than the perpetrator was a male and was a member of 12.9% of the UK male population. In the village of Narbra, however, speculation was rising about the perpetrator. Black Pad and the village itself was located close to Carlton Hayes Mental Institution, a psychiatric hospital, and many believed that the culprit had been an escaped patient. Police followed this lead, but no patient had been missing from the hospital on the night of the attack. What the police did realise was that whomever killed Linda knew the area well. The black pad was a shortcut only known to locals and would have been hard to stumble across to non-natives of the area. The police expanded their search to other villages close to Narbra, including Whetstone, Littlethorpe and Enderby. But this yielded no results, and with no new witnesses and very little evidence, the killer remained at large, and the investigation was stalling. It was frustrating, but there was no information coming in, and there was very little that we could do, except just try and keep the inquiry alive using the media. Inevitably, and to Linda's family's great dismay, the investigation wound down altogether. The police didn't close the case, but unless a new witness came forward or evidence was found, their investigation had dried up. Over the following years, Linda's family slowly tried to rebuild their lives, and the local villages gradually went back to being communities that allowed their children out after dark and kept their doors open. Because, surely, lightning didn't strike twice. Certainly not in such a quiet, rural, friendly, safe area. Police this morning are stepping up their search for missing schoolgirl, 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth, who went missing two days ago in the Leicestershire village of Enderby. Earlier, police said they were extremely concerned for the safety of Dawn and are appealing for any information that may lead to her safe return. On the 31st of July, 1986, four years after Linda's murder, 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth had been walking from her village, Enderby, to visit a friend in Narbra, just a mile away. It was an early summer's evening and the weather was balmy, so Dawn was wearing a skirt, a blouse and a light jacket. Dawn attended the same school as Linda had, Lutterworth Grammar. Like Linda, Dawn liked clothes and fashion, and she was also very artistic and loved to draw and paint and she was known as a sensible girl. Dusk was just starting to settle as she crossed through a wooded area to reach the village. When Dawn didn't arrive home that evening, and it was confirmed that she had never arrived at her friend's house in Narborough, Dawn's parents, frantic with worry, immediately contacted the police. 
David Baker, the investigator whom had been in charge of Linda Mann's case, also took charge of Dawn's investigation and immediately galvanised all resources available to him to search every inch of Enderby and Narbra for the missing teenager. The Linda Mann case had always weighed heavy on him, that he'd been unable to solve the case, and he vowed to Dawn's parents that he would do all he could to find their daughter. But after 36 hours of searching, there was still no sign of Dawn, and the shocked community held their breath in hope that this was a good sign. But when the search moved into day two... The body discovered this morning by police in Enderby has been identified as that of missing schoolgirl Dawn Ashworth. 15-year-old Dawn went missing two days ago after failing to return from a friend's house. Some are already linking her murder with that of Linda Mann four years ago. If they didn't believe it before, the police now did think that not only was the killer a local person, but also the similarities between the murder of Dawn Ashworth and Linda Mann four years earlier were too alike not to be connected. Not only did the heinous acts occur in the same vicinity, but the MO had been the same. 15-year-old girls, dark-haired, walking alone in wooded areas after dark, both brutally raped and then strangled using their own clothing. In addition, the assailant had left semen on Dawn's underwear. And yep, you guessed it, it was from a group A secreta, the exact same type as Linda's murderer. The police began to consider that they may have a serial killer on their hands, one whom, if they didn't catch soon, may take the life of somebody else. The two villages of Narbra and Enderby were paralysed with fear and were demanding justice. And rightly so. Galvanised, the police widened their search and intensified door-to-door -door inquiries, and the local communities of Narborough and Enderby assisted the police wherever they could, eager, also, to catch the perpetrator and return their neighbourhoods to save communities once again. The police put out daily bulletins in the media to help garner more attention. And this paid off. A lady, having seen the news about Dawn's murder, contacted the police. She had been driving along the Leicester to Coventry Road near Narbra on the 31st of July. She'd seen a man on a motorbike coming out of the wooded area, the area where Dawn had been found. Finally, the police had a lead. Once the police released this information to the media, Several more witnesses came forward. They'd seen the same man on the same bike in the same location on other evenings, driving up and down the pathway and the wooded areas. And this is when the police realised that they too had seen this man. When they had been searching the woods for dawn, a man on a bike had approached them and asked what they were doing. When they explained they were looking for a missing girl, the man had said, I knew you were looking in the wrong place. Before the police had a chance to question him, the man sped off on his motorbike. However, given the small nature of the communities and the multiple witnesses, it wasn't long before the police identified and located the man and brought him in for questioning. The man was called Richard Buckland. He was 17 and he worked as a kitchen porter at the local psychiatric hospital. The very one where Narborough residents had believed that Linda Mann's killer had escaped from. No one considered that the perpetrator might not have been a patient at the facility, but instead an employee. Whilst Buckland was being questioned, his body fluids were tested. He was a Group A secretor, the very type found on Linda and Dawn's clothing. He also did not have an alibi for the time and date that Dawn went missing. The police knew they had their man. Now, they just needed a confession. Buckland was interviewed extensively over several days, with little respite in between. And finally, 
On the third day, Buckland broke down and confessed to Dawn's murder. He had come across Dawn walking in the woods when he was riding his motorbike. He'd started talking to her, and then he'd asked her for sex. When she declined, he jumped on her, pushing her to the ground, and he forced himself on her. But she was making so much noise that he needed to shut her up before her howls of fear attracted attention. And so he raped her and he killed her. When he was done, he covered her body with light brush. They had him. Not only did he have the correct blood group and he was a secretor, but Buckland had confessed. And the details of his confession were very similar to Dawn's post-mortem results and the condition they found the body. The case was closed and the perpetrator was behind bars awaiting a very lengthy sentence. Hallelujah and Amen. So, by now, we should be coming to the end of this episode. The communities of Enderby and Nabra can breathe a sigh of relief and sleep easier at night and the families of Dawn and Linda will finally have justice for their daughters. But if you look at the timer on the episode, you will see that we still have quite some time to go. The reason for this? Well, cracks started to appear in the case against Buckland. Whilst Buckland had admitted to the murder of Dawn, no matter how much persuasion or coercion the police pressed upon Buckland, he just would not admit to the murder of Linda Mann. But the police absolutely knew the two cases were perpetrated by the same person. From their forensic evidence and knowledge of crime scenes, there was absolutely no doubt that both murders were the work of one sick individual. But Buckland categorically refused to confess to Linda's murder. And to add further contention, there was Buckland's confession. I got her onto the ground. I thought she wanted it, but she kept on pushing me away, telling me to get off her. I, I grabbed her. I pulled down her trousers, and she wouldn't stop shouting, and, and, and so I hit her. I hit her to shut her up. For those of you who may not have picked up the anomalies, I mentioned earlier that Dawn was wearing a skirt on the night she was killed, as it was a balmy summer's evening. Buckland refers to pulling down her trousers. Also, Dawn died in the same manner that Linda did, strangulation. But in his confession, Buckland said that he hit her over the head to shut her up. Neither Dawn nor Linda had a head wound. To complicate matters, Buckland had learning difficulties and was susceptible to coercion. Chief Investigator David Baker realised that he was about to go to trial with a case so vulnerable that he was either going to convict an innocent man or potentially put a guilty man back into the community. He needed more evidence, solid evidence, one way or another. It just so happened that Chief Investigator David Baker liked to read the newspaper and he recalled reading an article in the Leicester Mercury about a geneticist at the local Leicester University, one Dr Alec Jeffries, whom had made a remarkable and quite accidental discovery during a failed experiment to study the way in which inherited illnesses pass through families. Alec had started by examining the DNA sequence found in the myoglobin genes of seals. Myoglobin is an oxygen binding protein found in muscle tissue. It is essential to diving mammals like seals and whales that need to swim to great depths in order to feed. The myoglobin enables them to hold oxygen in their bodies for long periods of time. Mice have the myoglobin gene. And so do we. Within the DNA sequence of the seal myoglobin gene, Alec identified a repeating sequence, or a stutter. He realised that these stutters were unique to each individual seal, and therefore 
could be used to distinguish one seal from another, or one person from another. It wasn't long before Alec Jeffries realised that each living entity on the planet had their own unique stutter in their genetic makeup, a stutter that identified them beyond any doubt. In short, Alec Jeffries had just discovered DNA fingerprinting. The article that David Baker read was about how Alec Jeffries had applied this new science to assisting with immigration cases, whereby children were being denied British citizenship as authorities did not believe they were the natural offspring of their nationalised parents. In each case, Jeffries was able to irrefutably evidence that the children were the natural offspring using DNA fingerprinting. David Baker remembered this article. Well, if it could work to show a familial pattern, could it work to identify a perpetrator? Baker contacted Jeffries to see if he could help them. Oh, he knew it was a long shot. This was a completely new and not widely known about or tested science. But Baker knew he could not progress with the trial against Buckland without concrete evidence and this seemed like the only way he was going to get it. So, he contacted Jeffries. Baker was looking for Jeffries to identify one person as the assailant instead of a percentage of the population. However, for Jeffries, yeah, this presented a bit of a problem. My initial reaction was, well, yes, we'll try, but don't hold out too much hope. Nobody's ever attempted this sort of analysis on relatively old, real forensic casework. You see, all the tests that Jeffries had conducted thus far had been on blood taken from live people in a recent time frame. Baker was asking Jeffries to test samples that were up to four years old, possibly corroded and most likely not stored well enough to maintain the integrity of the samples. But he agreed to give it a go. He carried out tests on Buckland's blood and on semen taken from the dead girl's clothing. He worked through the night to finish the work. When he took the film from the developing tank, well, even he was shocked. He took his findings to Baker, and the results? Yeah, they were a massive blow to him and the task force. The DNA results for the perpetrator did not match Richard Buckland at all. But the results did prove something that Baker had been convinced of all along. But what we do know is that it was indeed the same man that raped and murdered both girls. So, Buckland had clearly given a false confession. His DNA did not match that of the assailant. He was released from detainment immediately. But now the police were back to square one, and the only thing they absolutely knew from Jeffrey's findings was that the same man had killed both girls. The following month, the detectives decided that the technology that had exonerated Buckland should be used to try and catch the killer. They knew the killer was a local man, so they decided to screen the DNA of the entire male population of Enderby and Narborough. Therefore, by process of elimination, the perpetrator would be caught. Letters were sent to every male aged between 18 and 34 who had lived in Narborough and Enderby in recent years, asking them to agree to give a blood sample. Two testing centres were opened, one in a local school and one in a council office, and there were two testing sessions, morning and evening, three days a week. Each man was expected to bring proof of identity, such as their passport or a driver's license. The world's first DNA manhunt is underway. Thousands of men from the villages of Narborough, Littlethorpe and Enderby have this week been attending voluntary blood tests in an attempt to catch the killer of two Leicestershire schoolgirls. Did you have any doubts about coming tonight? Not at all, no. I think the uh, person responsible might have. It was a voluntary scheme and most of the men in the villages came forward without issues. In fact, 
The whole community galvanised behind the operation. All their hopes were pinned to this new science, to catch the killer amongst them. A few men did decline, citing that they didn't like needles or saying they didn't like police officers. But most of these men soon changed their minds when they came under scrutiny from both the police and the local communities. By the end of the month, around 1,000 men had volunteered to give samples, and the forensic science laboratories that were conducting the tests were struggling to keep up. But still, the police did not have a suspect. After eight months, 5,511 men had given blood samples, but there was still no match. Police were struggling to keep the case open, and public enthusiasm for this new fangled science was rapidly waning. What had been promised to them as a catch-all approach was turning into a catch-none scenario. So, the police decided to cast their net wider, and they put out a national appeal for any male that had lived or worked in the area in the last five years to come forward. Few did. But the police knew that someone, anyone out there, had to know something. And it was only a matter of time before that person would say something, whether intentionally or inadvertently, to someone else. We, as people, are not equipped for keeping such monumental secrets to ourselves, especially when so much media attention and pressure was being garnered both nationally and internationally regarding the use of this new scientific method in a criminal investigation. So, all they had to do was wait. In August 1987, almost a year after Dawn had been killed, Ian Kelly had been out for a drink at the local pub with some of his work colleagues. He was particularly attracted to one of the female colleagues and was hoping to use this opportunity to impress her. But what he told her that night had an alternate reaction. They were talking about work colleagues at the bakery where they all worked. When the female co-worker brought up the name of Colin Pitchfork, all the women in the group recoiled. Colin was known throughout the factory for being, well, a bit of a creep. He was always trying to chat up the women and making suggestive comments and attempted failed and repellent forms of flattery. He was definitely known as the one to avoid. As the females were denouncing Pitchfork, Ian Kelly piped up, wanting to be part of the conversation, hopeful to get his female colleagues' attention. My friend said something and he said, well, he asked me to take a blood test. And I turned around and said, yeah, I, I took that test for him. For about two or three seconds, conversation went quiet. I just said it and that was the end of it. I mean, if somebody had turned around and said, well, do you realise what you've said? Then I probably would have, well, what do you mean? Well, then I probably would have realised like. Kelly went on to explain to the group that Pitchfork had asked for this favour because he'd already taken a test for a friend who had a conviction for indecent exposure when he was younger. If he took the test twice, Pitchfork and his friend would be caught by the police. At first, Kelly hadn't wanted to take the test for him, but Pitchfork was persuasive and relentless and bullying in his approach towards Kelly. And unfortunately, Kelly was not, well, let's say of a high intelligence capacity, and Pitchfork soon wore him down with his coercive tactics. Disgusted and aghast, the female colleague pondered over what to do with this information. Every day at work, she faced both Kelly and Pitchfork. Whenever she saw them, she recoiled, her skin literally crawling at being in close proximity to them both. She tossed and turned at night, and eventually... Hello, is that the police? It's about their murders. I don't want to bother you. It's probably just nothing. It wasn't nothing. It was something. And something quite big. In fact, it was the break that they had been waiting for. The police immediately took Ian Kelly in for questioning. And well, he wasted no time in getting this heavy, secretive load 
off his chest. He told them how Pitchfork had badgered him for weeks to take the test for him, even becoming aggressive with him. And in the end, Kelly had given in. Pitchfork had to take the test on the 27th of August, and he spent weeks doctoring his passport so that it would pass for Kelly. Using the steam from an iron and a towel to prevent burning, he slowly removed the plastic seal on the passport. He then replaced his photo with one that he had forced Kelly to take in a booth. Using an iron again, but this time also using a transparent adhesive glue, he re-steamed the plastic seal on the passport. How on earth does a baker working in a factory know how to doctor passports? Well, he didn't. But what he did know from his intricate work with icing and pastries was how to take his time, work methodically, and how to create very complicated designs, all required skills for bakery and forgery. Oh, and if anyone is considering at this point on doctoring their own passport in a similar fashion, yeah, this all happened in 1987. Trust me, technology and passport design has moved on greatly, and the method that Pitchfork used would only serve to melt your passport today. Not that I know from experience, of course. Finally, finally, after all these years, the police had a breakthrough in the case. They had a name, but did it match the DNA profile that Dr. Alec Jeffries had unearthed? Given Kelly's confession, the police had enough information to be able to arrest Pitchfork on suspected rape and murder. And so, on the 19th of September, 1987, the police arrested 27-year-old Pitchfork at his home. He gave no resistance and confessed almost immediately upon his detainment to his crimes. Oh, and when they tested his blood, his stutter was a perfect match with that found on Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth's clothing. <laughs> so, just who is Colin Pitchfork? And why had he raped and murdered two innocent, beautiful girls? Colin Pitchfork was born in March 1960. He was one of three children and grew up in the village of Newbold Verdon in Leicestershire. Pitchfork attended Market Bosworth High School and for all intents and purpose, he was a very normal, loving child and displayed no outwardly signs of a deviant behaviour. Well, to his family at least. He left school in 1976 and became a baker at Hampshire's Bakery in Leicester. He continued to work there until he was arrested in 1987. In 1981, Colin married social worker Carol, whom he had met whilst doing voluntary work in a children's home. Hmm. Well, they clearly didn't do background testing in the 1980s. The couple lived in Leicester and went on to have two children, all seemingly normal. Or was it? It actually transpired during Pitchfork's investigation that he had a string of exposure convictions going back many years. He was renowned in the local area for being a bit, well, disturbing. He took every opportunity available to him to chat up and flirt with women and thought nothing of inappropriately touching women he knew as he would pass them by. Before the murder of Linda Mann in 1983, Pitchfork had been convicted of several counts of indecent exposure. Hmm. There we go, those early signs of divergent behaviour. Furthermore, in February 1979, Pitchfork indecently assaulted a teenage girl. Unfortunately, he was not convicted afterwards. Amazingly, his wife Carol knew nothing of his past indiscretions and troubled behaviour towards women. Hmm. Hmm. Pitchfork was brought to trial for his crimes on the 22nd of January 1988 at Leicester Crown Court. Fortunately, 
the deplorable dung heap pleaded guilty, thus sparing Linda and Dawn's family a trial. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for the two murders, which is 30 years. He was also sentenced to 10 years for the two rapes and three years for the two indecent assaults. Oh, and he was also given three years for the conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, i.e. by avoiding to give a DNA sample. Ian Kelly, the colleague whom gave a blood sample instead of pitchfork, was given a suspended sentence of 18 months. So that's it. The repellent cockwomble has been locked up for life, behind bars, never to know or taste freedom again. Or will he? Now, in the UK, a maximum life sentence is 30 years, and always at the end of the prison term, the prisoner has the right to petition for parole. We do not do life sentences without parole, as there is a belief that all offenders can be rehabilitated through penance of serving their term, support to rehabilitate into society, and some therapy. I use that term rather lightly as it tends to be intermittent within the prison system. There has been much debate about this in the UK, especially with regards to paedophiles. As their miscreancy is usually born of a deviant psychological disorder, some people argue that the psychological disorders of this magnitude are seldom solved with penance, support, therapy or pills. The aberration is too inherent to their makeup to be resolved with conventional methods of therapy. In short, they will not change. However, in my research, I found that a range of international studies have put reoffending rates for sex offenders, including paedophiles, at between 15% and 43% over the course of their lives after release. When you compare this to the overarching study of all reoffenders, which shows that 75% of ex-inmates reoffend within 9 years of release and 39% within the first 12 months, well, the reoffender rate or recidivism rate is actually somewhat lower for paedophiles and sex offenders by comparison. Now, please do not think I am supporting or in any way defending paedophiles and sex offenders. I am not. I am merely relaying statistics, and links to these will be posted in the show notes. But the facts do seem to point to a low recidivism rate amongst this group of offenders. Now, despite the lower reoffending rates, I personally don't want any of them back on the streets living in our neighbourhoods. Do you? In 2009, the putrid pitchfork actually had the audacity to appeal his sentence, requesting a reduced term to a court of appeal. There wasn't a cat in hell's chance any court in the kingdom would grant such a loathsome piece of faecal matter a reprieve on his sentence. Would they? Yes, good evening. A convicted child killer has won his appeal to have his sentence cut. Colin Pitchfork murdered two schoolgirls in Leicestershire in the 1980s. Today at the High Court in London, his sentence was reduced from 30 to 28 years on the grounds of his exceptional progress. Huh. Unbelievable. That rectal discharge would now be eligible for parole in 2016. Needless to say, the villagers of Narbra and Enderby were, well, outraged. And the families of Linda and Dawn, well, they're devastated with the news. It reopened the wounds of two decades prior, and they honestly felt that his life was now more important than their daughter's. I don't know, I just can't help think they've died for nothing. Life should be life. However, Pitchfork's lawyers had argued that he had never been placed on report whilst in prison and had made exceptional progress whilst incarcerated. He had developed a technique to transcribe music into Braille and his work had been used internationally. 
Okay, so he's made progress. Contributed to the better understanding of music for the hearing impaired. Apparently, he even had artwork displayed at the Royal Festival Hall in April of 2009, which sparked outrage, and so the exhibit was soon removed. But, no matter how talented he may be, and how much he may have given back, the fact is that the man raped and killed two young girls for his own sick pleasure. Whilst the reoffender rate amongst his criminal group is marginally lower, it will take more than a bit of artwork to convince me that he should have a reduced sentence. But apparently that is not how the Court of Appeal saw it, and his sentence was reduced. So now, this means that the reprobate could be freed from prison as early as 2016. However, it wasn't until 2017 that Pitchfork went up against the parole board and he was confident that he would win his parole. He had been a model inmate after all. And the parole board denied him, citing that he was still a danger to the public. Well, hallelujah and amen. But because of Pitchfork's supposedly exemplary behaviour, he was moved to an open prison in 2017. Just this year, 2020, Pitchfork has applied to the parole board again for release. He has now spent 32 years behind bars, and he has told friends and family that this time, he really, really is confident that he'll be released. Hmm. Due to his open prisoner status, Pitchfork has been allowed day outings from HMP Layhill in Gloucestershire. He has been spotted browsing the shops on the high streets. He looks very different now. Prison has definitely aged him, and not in a good way. We're still awaiting the news as to whether Pitchfork will be fully paroled, but in the horrible event that he is, here is my public service announcement to any Britons out there. He is now 59 years old, portly, grey beard, grey hair and has heavy eyelids. He goes by the name of David Thorpe now and I've put a picture on my Facebook group so that you can recognise him. So that is the horrible, gruesome story of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, taken way too soon by a repulsive, vile, noxious specimen of a human being. Needless to say, the capture and conviction of Colin Pitchfork sent shockwaves through the justice and criminal investigation world. A new science that could pinpoint people with near 100% accuracy just based on their blood? It was unheard of, unprecedented. But it had arrived. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, you're going to like next week's even more. But until then, if you like this podcast, please don't forget to rate, like and subscribe at wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, can I ask a huge favour of you? Would you mind sharing this podcast with just one of your friends at least? It would be greatly appreciated. For show content, please see my Facebook group, Darkside Podcast, and also my website, darksidepodcast.co.uk. I would just like to say another huge shout out to those of you who have commented on my Facebook group. You are all making me blush. But an extra special thank you to Season this week for her five star review on iTunes. Reviews on this platform or wherever you listen to your podcasts, really do go such a great way to improving my street cred in the podcasting world. So, until next time, stay safe, stay alert. Soos.
streaming only on Peacock. She was this moneyed, social girl. Ghislaine Maxwell had it all until she met Jeffrey Epstein. Maxwell helped connect him to the wealthy and famous. Then it all came crashing down. Ghislaine Maxwell's charged with enticement of minors, sex trafficking of children, and perjury. Now, a new three-part documentary reveals her story. How on earth could she have got to this place? Epstein's Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. Streaming now, only on Peacock.